Hello, my name is Karen Golden Orante for Living Histories for the Cohasset Historical Society. I am here with Bill Zartman, whom I had the pleasure of having dinner with, who had the entire table captivated, not to be punny, but you had us all captivated with his story um, as a prisoner of war of World War II. And Bill wrote a book that is called East to the Ruskies, which if I could just read um, a little bit from your prologue, because that sums up a little bit of the, your story. Right. In late January 1944, first and third American Ranger battalions with the fourth in the rear, 767 Rangers were ordered on a night raid on Cisterna, Italy. Intelligence had indicated there would be little or no German presence in the area. Unfortunately, intelligence was faulty, resulting in one of the most colossal of loss of life in World War II. When it became obvious that our casualties were so severe that continuation of the mission would have assured the annihilation of the two battalions, we surrendered. I had been hit by sniper's bullet in my back but my wound was clearly not life-threatening and I joined the others who were ambulatory. We were a young group of rangers. I suspect having turned 19 only three weeks earlier, I was definitely one of the youngest. We were all prisoners of war. Strangely, at this critical point, my mind chose to wander and I conjured images from a quieter, safer time, far from the dangers of the moment. Indeed, I was quite certain that I would be dead before the day's end, and the prospect frightened me. But somehow, other, more pleasant images worked their way to the forefront, and my thoughts were transported to the secure and pleasant place where it all started, Shemokin, Pennsylvania. So Bill, could you please tell us how you started in Shemokin, Pennsylvania, your career, and then your career in the Army. Ultimately, you ended up moving to the South Shore. You've been here for close to 40 years, and your story is absolutely fascinating. Okay, well, that uh, sounds great, Karen. Uh, I uh, was in Coal Township, was the name of the high school I was in, in Shemokin. And uh, I had completed my junior year in Shemokin in high school. And uh, during the summer school vacation, uh, I had a call from uh, a friend of mine whose father was the uh, uh, Pennsylvania unemployment office manager. And he told me that there was a uh, man coming into Shemokin over the weekend uh, looking for people to travel in on a, with Procter & Gamble on a coupon crew, a traveling coupon crew. And uh, I was very interested in that and made an appointment to go in on Saturday and meet this guy and ended up getting a job and uh, started to work and when it came time to go back to school uh, in October or September uh, I decided I was going to stay in uh, with uh, Procter & Gamble and enjoy the traveling. That didn't go down too well with my brother and my parents. Uh, my brother came to take me home and I sent him back without me. Uh, but I stayed there and uh, we were, uh, what was happening was uh, the coupon crews were, consisted of a crew manager and five uh, crew, five people on the crew and, and then another guy who had a three quarter ton panel truck with P&G signs all over the sides of it. He would call on the local grocery stores in advance of the coupon crew and uh, have them make sure that they all had enough product of the, all the new products that P&G had introduced in the past year, like Duds and Ivory Snow and Ivory Flakes and so on, Crisco, Green Shampoo. Uh, and <clears throat> the coupon crew would go door to door and pan out coupons and then they would cast them in at the store. In any event, the man who was the store man, as we called him, who had the panel truck, uh, he got drafted and they were looking for a replacement and my boss said, do you think you can handle that job? I said, sure. So I became store man and uh, 
On December the 7th, I was in, I had just pulled into Reading, Pennsylvania on a Sunday, and we were going to start couponing the town on a Monday. And uh, it was a snowy, cold day, I remember, and I got a, a room in a B&B, uh, &B, place similar to what we call a B&B &B today in West Reading, Pennsylvania. And I went into town to see what the town looked like, because I had never been to Reading before. And uh, I saw they had a very nice department store there, and I went in to see if I could find a gift for my mother for Christmas, because it was coming up quickly, soon. And uh, I bought my mother a scarf, and I, I met a, the, the young lady who was the clerk in the store, was very attractive and uh, very friendly, so I suggested, uh, it was too bad that I didn't know her sooner, I could uh, maybe invite her to dinner tonight. And she said, well, maybe we could, we could get acquainted over dinner. And uh, I dated her, and uh, that night when we came back, we went to a movie and a dinner, and when we came back, her mother said, you know, they're predicting a very bad snowstorm. She said, I don't think you should try to drive to your, to play your staying. I think you should stay here overnight. And I did, and I slept on the sofa bed in the living room. And in the morning, I woke up to hear the Atwater Kent radio playing music. And then I heard them break in on the radio and announce that uh, Pearl Harbor had just been invaded by the Japanese. or uh, uh, They had bombed out all the ships in the harbor. That was my introduction to World War II. Um, I went home for Christmas and uh, uh, a few days after the 1st of January, I got a phone call from the man, his name was Mr. Reidiger, Bud Reidiger. He was in Philadelphia. He was in charge of all field advertising for Procter & Gamble. And he said they had just uh, had the salesman for New England had just been drafted. And they needed a salesman to cover all of New England. He said, do you think you can handle a job? I said, sure. So he told me to go to New York, to a place in New York at the Port of Embarkation, pick up a brand new Country Squire Ford station wagon, drive up to Boston, go to this address, meet a guy by the name of Stan Gallagher, who was the guy being drafted, and uh, that, that I would replace him. So I took over all, he gave me all the uh, description of what my job would be, turned the maps over. We all worked from maps. So I learned how to read maps very, very thoroughly uh, in my, my, life, my life with P&G, which helped me 60 years later when I bought a sailboat and was sailing on the North Atlantic. Uh, anyway, uh, I went to Boston. I covered Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts. I worked for the year there, and uh, at the end of the year, I went home for Christmas again in December. and. Shortly after Christmas, uh, I turned 18, January 3rd, 1943, and um, I petitioned my parents to approve my going in the service. Even though I was 18, I had to have, still had to have parental approval. Um, so I signed up for the duration. In a few weeks, was sent to Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, near Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania. From there, I, they, I was assigned to, uh, they chose, uh, first of all, the Army, and then secondly, the Infantry, and uh, I got my suit, new set of clothes to replace my Hickey Freeman suits that I had, and, and I was, next thing, I found myself on a train on my way to Florida, and I thought, boy, this Army, isn't, life isn't bad. Uh, first, the place they send me is to Florida. Boy, I'd have done this easily any time. So I went to Florida, I arrived at Camp Landing. A few days later on the train, we arrived at Camp Landing, Florida, near Stark, which is near Jacksonville, and started my training in, in the Army. And I was assigned to an infantry division, the 66th Infantry, started going through all of the training program there. And one day, uh, I was going by the company headquarters and I noticed a bulletin on the wall that said that they were looking for volunteers for a new organization in the American Army being formed called the Rangers. 
and uh, it was strictly a volunteer. They couldn't draft you into the Rangers. So I thought, that sounds great. That sounds like a lot of fun. So uh, I went to my drill sergeant the next day, and I told him about this notice on the bulletin board. He said, yeah, I said, I saw it. And he said, you're not interested in that, I hope. I said, yes, I am. He said, well, you must be nuts. Anyway, uh, uh, I asked him for an appointment to see the company commander because I said, uh, I understand that there's one qualification that I don't meet. You have to be a non-commissioned officer, an NCO, and I'm just a private. And uh, I said, uh, he said, well, you think you could talk Captain Randall into do something, doing something about that? I said, yeah, I, I'd like to give it a shot. So he made an appointment with Captain Randall, and I went in to see him the next day. And uh, Captain Randall said, what can I do for you? And I told him the story. And he said, uh, and exactly how do you expect to get to be an NCO? And Captain Randall looked into it and said that uh, the requirement was, could, it could be a PFC as long as you were a temporary corporal. <laughs> so <laughs> politics in the Army is just like it is in the rest of our lives. Uh, there's always a way to beat the game. So uh, Captain Randall said, uh, what makes you think I would? I said, well, a sergeant said that maybe you could do something about it. And he said, oh, he did, did he? I'll have to talk to him about that. Uh, Anyway, uh, I was accepted into the Rangers and went through an, an exhaustive training program for, um, I think it was around six weeks. And at the end of that training, uh, there were only, I can't remember the exact numbers or percentage, but uh, many of the men washed out. They simply couldn't complete the training. It was very rugged. And one of the things that helped me was I spent most of, much of my life on the tennis courts as a kid, and I was used to playing tennis for hours in a 100 degree temperature. So the Florida heat didn't bother me like it was hitting most of the other guys who were from the north. Uh, they just couldn't take the heat. Anyway, uh, before long I found myself on a train on the way, the way to uh, Newport News, Virginia, where we boarded a uh, ship a victory ship, and the ship I was on was called the George H. Dern, uh, but we knew we were, obviously we knew we were going by water, not rail, rail, railroad. We left Patrick Henry a few days later, and when we came out, when we got out into the bay, uh, we could see this large armada of ships assembled on the ocean, on the Atlantic, and uh, this was going to be a large convoy, uh, mostly merchant ships, but also there were a lot of support vessels to protect the convoy, destroyers, uh, everything just about except a, an aircraft carrier. So we boarded there and we had no idea where we were going and of course uh, that game is a big, that's a big game in the Army is who knows where we're going and there were all kinds of guys who swore they knew exactly where we were going and they were willing to bet you a took carton of cigarettes on the, on the deal. We spent 33 days on that uh, boat, and uh, we didn't have any activity of any kind military until uh, about 30 days later, after we had boarded, we had just gone past the Rock of Gibraltar, which was off the port beam of the ship. We had a clear view of the Rock of Gibraltar, and I think it was that same afternoon, late in the afternoon, uh, suddenly there were seven Heinkel 109 dive bombers came right out of the horizon, uh, flying low over the water so we wouldn't spot them until the last minute. And they started dropping bombs on the vessels in the convoy and they hit a t one of the tankers running off our port beam, took a direct hit, and within probably less than 15 minutes it was completely gone all hands on board were lost. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the convoy. Uh, I was on a 20, I was assigned to a 20 millimeter gun uh, because the, uh, there weren't enough sailors on board to man all the guns on the merchant ships. So they had asked for volunteers to man the 20 millimeter guns. 
and I had volunteered for that, so I ended up on the Port Bridge. So that was my first action in World War II. Uh, after the uh, experience on the Mediterranean with the Heinkels, uh, several days later, we pulled into Naples, Italy. So uh, the guessing game was over. We at least know where we're at now. And uh, we were assembled on the dock in a warehouse building, and there was uh, a ranger lieutenant and a sergeant waiting for us there. So they identified and sorted out all of the guys that were ranger volunteers. And they took us in uh, trucks to uh, a place in Naples that was a, had been a racetrack. And uh, it was not operating, obviously, as a racetrack. Uh, and I might add that uh, this particular period of time, this was just a matter of a few weeks after the Italians had capitulated. So the war in Italy, uh, other than in northern Italy, where the Germans were still on Italian soil, uh, the Italians were all uh, finished with the war and they were all free and happy to be alive and happy to be under the Americans. We spent uh, a, maybe a week or ten days in the, in the uh, racetrack and we were all uh, tested and assigned for what our skills were and uh, I was selected to be a scout for the company commander for Fox Company in the 1st Battalion and his name was Jim Fowler. He was a second lieutenant. Uh, he had uh, gotten a battlefield commission. He was a non-com when the Rangers went into Africa and he uh, conducted himself in such a heroic way there that he was given a battlefield commission as a second lieutenant. Uh, he was a great guy. He probably was only about three or four years older than I was. He was probably 22 or 23. Uh, but he hardly needed to shave. He, he was still a pretty young guy. Uh, uh, we were assigned our weapons uh, and uh, most of us, uh, most of the guys got rifles. Uh, there was one guy, my friend Danny, who was a very large guy and, and rugged as blazes, and Danny was assigned a BAR, which is a Browning Automatic Rifle. And it takes a real man to handle a BAR because it has a bipod, and unless you're laying on the ground and supporting the barrel with the bipod, you can't hold it. it, it it'll, it'll knock you right over with firing it. And. Uh, Anyway, Danny was the kind of a guy who was rugged enough to take that thing and put it up and, at his waist and fire it and still control it. I was assigned at, as, a, as a scout for the company commander, as I said, and um, I was issued a, a Thompson submachine gun, a 45 pistol, and a combat knife. Just about every one of us was issued a combat knife, and we were trained uh, skillfully in, in the use of knives uh, because of doing behind the enemy lines. One of the purposes of the Rangers was to make raids behind the enemy lines and it was to be as quiet as possible. They tried to train you that you could go in, do your job and get out without anybody knowing you were even there. So we were then, uh, we, we got on trucks there and uh, we went to probably an hour, an hour and a half away by truck, north of Naples. We came to a town by the name of Venafro, Italy. Uh, came down out of the trucks and we were assembled and told that we were going to have to go through the center of the town of Venafro and we couldn't, the vehicles couldn't go through there because they were, they were too much, they made too much noise and they would announce our coming. So we were going to walk through, so we had to be alert of any possible snipers on either side of the street, the main street that went through the center of town. Anyway, we did that and we came out the other side of town, the north side, and uh, there was, we, we, it was dark and we walked into a bivouac area that was the 180th Regiment of the American Army. Anyway, we uh, dug our foxholes and bedded down for the night there, 
and the next morning at, at daybreak, uh, we saw this big field kitchen was set up by the infantry organization. One of the things that, that we didn't have in the Rangers, we didn't have medical supply, uh, med medics, <coughs> excuse me, and we didn't have any kitchen. So we had no way of, of getting our own food. So what they did, the way they did handle that was, wherever we were, in Africa, Sicily, Italy, uh, they, we would be a, whatever, whatever infantry outfit we were closest to would be given the job of feeding us uh, three meals a day. Well, we only got breakfast at this one here, and, and then we were off to the top of the mountain. Uh, one of the things that I never, I've never lost sight of that I experienced for the first time while we were at that field kitchen having breakfast, uh, I observed little Italian kids, six, seven, eight years old, uh, all hanging around the, the mess pails. Uh, we had big, there were large uh, trash barrels and when you finished eating, you would take your mess kit, which of course you had to clean and take with you because it was with you permanently, your mess kit, it was a metal mess kit, and you had to clean it out in these barrels. And these Italian kids were waiting there and uh, they knew that when everybody was finished eating and they closed the kitchen, that the kids would be allowed to go into these barrels. And I stood there and watched and waited and saw this happen. These kids reaching over the barrel, just taking a, the mix of food in the barrel in their hands and eating it right out of the barrels. A picture that I've never lost sight of. Uh, how lucky we are to have what we have here, here at home. Uh, anyway, uh, that same day, uh, Colonel Darby got up in front of the group put his hand up in the air and said, follow me. And I found out another tradition of the Rangers. The highest ranking officer on any event is the first one in front, which you don't usually find that. Uh, so Colonel Darby was the first guy in front and he led the way all the way to the top of the mountain. Uh, this mountain happened to be in a range of mountains south of Monte Cassino where the abbey was, the famous abbey that was bombarded so heavily in World War II. Two battalions following him, the first and third. We started off at the top of what uh, became Mount 509 or Mount Corno. For a couple hours we were walking through heavy timber, heavy tree, tree, tree areas on a trail that was very rough. And and then when we come out of that, at a level when we come out of the, where the foliage was, it was all rock from there to the top of the mountain was all rock. And the trail in, through the rocky areas particularly was all switchback. You'd go and change direction constantly. And the trail was just wide enough. The only people who went there other than military men uh, were the mules. And I found out again about the importance of mules in, in a war. Uh, the mules were used for two things. The mules were used, the mule train came up the mountain every day bringing ammunition and food and supplies. Whatever we needed, it came up by a mule train. And these were large containers that were strapped, two of them, one on each side of the mule's back in order to balance the weight of the, the load. And then on the way back down, they would take the dead down. So you'd have Americans slung over the mules in, barrack, in, in body bags uh, on their way down to be buried by the whatever infantry outfit was on the foot of the mountain. And that was pretty well a procedure, I think, in general. We spent uh, a right, uh, just about a month uh, on the top of Mount Corno and uh, freezing cold, I'll never forget Thanksgiving, and Colonel Darby was the same way. He would have never forgotten Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving, uh, Colonel Darby had arranged to have a hot meal brought up on, on a mule train. So they had a special mule, a couple of mules with large stainless steel uh, 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 pots uh, slung up one each, one each side of the mule's back 
and they had everything laid out in there in layers. They had uh, the, tur the turkey and the stuffing and so on. Then they had another layer where they had vegetables and another layer for desserts and so on. So it was a pretty complete meal. And we all enjoyed it on Thanksgiving Day. We had a great meal. And the reason we'll never forget it because uh, about one or two o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden everyone is uh, going to the latrine area. And it turned out that just about every one of us had the GIs. And Colonel Darby was livid. And he, I never heard him swear before. He, he was a very uh, well-versed uh, man and uh, knew the English language better and he used it. He didn't, he didn't swear at anything. But he did that day, or he came close to it anyway. Um, and he said, if I ever get down and get a hold of the cook that uh, put this together and failed to clean those pots, he said he'll be in, working in the kitchen for a long time, but he won't be touching any food. <laughs> anyway, uh, we came down off of the mountain in December, and uh, we were shipped back to Naples uh, by truck, and then uh, taken out to a little town called Pazzuli, uh, which is right on the uh, water uh, on the east part of Naples. And we were there for a couple of weeks. Uh, they had tents set up on the beach. It was a very delightful place, actually. There was a train station there that you could, if you wanted to go into Naples, you could take a train into Naples, which we did on a number of occasions. It was great. And we had some R&R. &R. We had some, we had to take in, get replacements for all of our dead. So we had quite a few bodies we had to replace in the Rangers to come up to our numbers. And uh, from there, we went by truck in January, early January, mid-January. Uh, and they were taken, we were taken to a dock where there were a lot of ships. And we boarded the, what was it? The Royal Ulsterman was a British uh, ship that was used uh, in England for many years uh, as a, uh, like a tourist boat or for, for to go to Glasgow, I think is where it, one, one of the destinations it had. Anyway, we were on there. It was a very nice ship, and we had good food, and we went to the an area that was off the coast of uh, Anzio. Anzio and Cisterna were the two key towns that we were going to invade. Uh, both of these towns were on the Apian Highway better known as the Road to Rome, uh, and both of them were south of Rome, probably about 50 or 60 miles south of Rome. Around the third week in Anzio, I'm trying to remember the date now for the, inv the actual invasion date, was uh, in, a in late January or mid-January. When we came into the beach in Anzio, much to our surprise, we went in on LCA, LCA's Landing Craft Infantry. And that was a bumpy ride, and a lot of guys got seasick on that ride. And then we got dumped off right in the water, which was not a very pleasant thing. Uh, water was at least waist deep, and you had a full field pack you were carrying, plus your weapon and a lot of ammunition. And uh, it wasn't a very pleasant way to hit the beach, but we did. And uh, we came in, we assaulted the town of Anzio, and much to our surprise, there was no resistance. There was no German there. Hmm. And uh, so we went through all the buildings looking for what was there, looking for people, but we didn't find, didn't find any. Uh, and there was all kinds of material there that uh, sort of re revealed the fact that this was a, had been a, uh, an R&R &R place for the German troops that were coming off of the front uh, at places like Monte Cassino and so on. When, when German troops were getting some R&R, &R, they would bring them to Anzio and they'd stay on the beach there for maybe a week or two and then sent, be sent back to the front again. One of my, in my view, one of the worst mistakes of the war in Italy occurred at Anzio when Colonel Darby wanted to go ahead and head for and take take Rome. Colonel Darby felt that with with the, the two battalions of rangers and 
maybe some, some of the paratroopers. There were two battalions of American paratroopers that also had invaded on our left flank at Anzio. And Darby felt that we could take Rome because there was no, res no sign of any resistance between where we were and Rome. But General Mark Clark and General Lucas, who were really the uh, decision makers on the, on the Battle of Anzio, wouldn't allow Darby to move ahead. And uh, to my, in my view, uh, all those white crosses at the Anzio Cemetery today uh, wouldn't be there if, if it wasn't for the refusal that Darby got. He could have saved a lot of lives by taking Rome because the Germans would have had to withdraw. Anyway, uh, on the end of, near the end, I think it was around the 30th of January, uh, we were told that we're going to move out tonight. And we got ready and around 11 o'clock at night we started the two battalions, the 1st and 3rd, heading into Anzio and the 4th Battalion heading toward Cisterna. The objective was for the 1st and 3rd Battalions to take the town of Anzio and take control of the Apian Highway and the job of the 4th Battalion was to open up a landing area for uh, American troops and tanks to, to come in to support us. We uh, went single file. Uh, the 1st Battalion in the front was Fox Company and the first man in front of Fox Company was Paul Dobson, Major uh, Dobson. He was fresh out of West Point, uh, had never had a day of combat, and he was in charge of the operation, which makes one someone wonder a bit. Uh, he's a great guy, but he just wasn't prepared for what he was given, the assignment he was given. Anyway, he was the front man, and his scout was behind him, was second, and behind him was Jim Fowler, the company commander of Fox Company, and behind him was me. And behind me was the entire, all the companies of the 1st Battalion plus the entire 3rd Battalion, strung out in this ditch, which was an irrigation ditch uh, called the Pontano Beach, the C Pontano Ditch, or locally by the Italians was known as Mussolini's Mussolini's Canal. We went ahead in the ditch very cautiously uh, with very little information from intel Army intelligence. Uh, at some point we were going and we approached uh, uh, where there was a road crossing. Dobson called a halt and we said, let's just, he said, let's just sit here for a minute and, li and listen. And we, somebody says, I think I hear a motorcycle. I, he I hear a vehicle and we waited and then it could tell it was a motorcycle and eventually this motorcycle came toward us and went right up on the road, right, went right past, in, right in front of us and the German driver had no idea how close he was to losing his life and of course we let him go because we didn't want to start anything now. We weren't in deep enough yet into the German lines to do anything so uh, an hour or two later uh, it's starting to get, you can see that daybreak is coming qu fast and we're, we weren't far enough. We knew we weren't deep enough at that point and because we weren't in the town yet. We were hoping to be in the town of, on the fringe, at least on the fringe of the town of, of Anzio or rather Cisterna uh, and uh, by before daybreak and we weren't going to make that. Major Dobson told us we're going to get out of, the, out of the ditch and see if we can move faster on, on a road. There was a road alongside the ditch going forward. So we got out and as we started to move we realized we we're walking into an area that's all like a vineyard and there were Germans sleeping all around us. We walked right into the middle of a German bivouac area. And Major Dobson, without a second thought, put his hand up for quiet, and then he took his knife out, held his knife out, and he pointed to the bodies on the ground, the Germans on the ground, and said, okay, you take that one, you take that one, you take that one. 
and they all got in position and he said to his runner and to me there was a half track parked over off to the side and the crew of the half track was sleeping underneath the half track and he said that I and, and his runner should take care of the half track. So we went over to where we were within uh, 10, 15 yards of the half track and we got uh, WP grenades ready and when Darby or when uh, Dobson gave the sign we threw our WPs in there. WP grenades if you don't know what they are is white phosphorus and it's one of the most devastating weapons you can use because it just destroys the morale in the enemy if they know that there's WP because it just burn it'll if you get a single drop of it on your hand it'll burn its way right through your hand in seconds mm -hmm. uh, so we used WP grenades to take care of the crew of the thing that was the end of them what happened in the meantime not we didn't that we didn't know was happening was the very end of the line which was back probably at least close to a mile uh, the third battalion the Germans had captured the guys on the very trailing edge and they were marching these guys up uh, out of the ditch onto the road and then they took all their weapons obviously most of them had run out of ammunition before this so had nothing to use the weapon for anyway and they started taking all these guys prisoner in the third battalion so as they came forward toward us they just increased the number of POWs until when they got to us we're on the northern end of the line and in the meantime a mortar shell had come in and hit close to Major Dobson and took a large chunk off his backside off his bottom and he was completely he couldn't even stand up he was so bad and one of our guys who had some medic training uh, had uh, attended to him with uh, some sulfur drug and whatever else he had. Eventually we all had, to, oh I, yeah I'm leaving out a little, there, there, we, there was, we came to a small building, uh, it was hard to figure out what this building was for, it was about the size of an oversized garage and it had two floors and we're on the back side of it so we couldn't see any way to get into it but we thought it would be a good place to bring Major Dobson and also for any other wounded, put the wounded guys in there so that the, 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 our medic guy could give them as much help as possible. Uh, when, 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 when Lieutenant Fowler was killed up on Mount 509, Lieutenant uh, Johnson became our company commander. So Johnson said to me, let's go around the other side of this house and see if we can see what's in it. So he went first and I followed him around to the front and we're looking at the building and there's a door down on the bottom on the, on the left side and there was a window up on the second floor. This was just a rough building made out of two by fours or something. It wasn't, uh, it, it, it wasn't any, any place that you'd ever want to spend a night in ordinarily. Anyway, he said, let's, let's back up, Get, we're too close, let's back up and get some grenades in there. So we threw grenades into the f first floor and nothing happened. So we were getting up to make a move to, r to run to the end of the front door and Johnson got hit and went down and, and there was a ditch there like it was just a, a narrow, like a drainage ditch and Johnson rolled into that and I was behind him and when he went down I dove down in the ground in the, in the same ditch where we're both laying. I, my head was right where his feet were and, and I said Johnson and by the way we didn't we never you called an officer we didn't call an officer lieutenant or major or colonel because that tells the German that he's a high-valued prisoner try and take him, take him alive if you can. Uh, so he simply called everybody by their name. So I said, Johnson, are you okay? And he didn't answer. And I said again, and I took his boot and I moved his boot and shook his boot and he didn't answer and I knew he had had it. 
So I crawled up just enough alongside of him to look and I saw we had taken a round right through his left temple. Anyway, I knew I had to get out of there and get back and I thought it was my going to be my last move anyway. So uh, I yelled for our guys to give me some cover. I told them what happened. And so two guys came around from the back of the house, the other the side of the house that we had been before. They came to the corner of the house and, and were looking for the sniper that had shot uh, Johnson. And he said, okay, come now, we got you covered. So I got up and started to run and a round hit me on the left shoulder. And it was from a German 31 millimeter rifle, a uh, sniper rifle. Anyway, I made it back behind and I threw myself down on the ground and in a little while our guy, our medic guy was still alive and well and he came by and he saw the blood in my thing so he cut my jacket open and he said, yeah, you're lucky, it, it's just a surface wound and he put some sulfa on it and he said, you'll be okay, you'll be fine. And in, in a matter of minutes the Germans just overwhelmed us. We were all taken uh, to a field and... Uh, so, now how, after you were captured, what did they, how they then brought you to the train to transport you out of there? Yes, they had us all together in, in, in this field that you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, and, which was right in... Uh, Cisterna? In, in the town of... Uh, was it Cisterna that's you Cisterna, were? Yeah. thank you. Uh, they took us in ambulances and some of the guys I guess were taken eventually in trucks to, uh, in my case, I was taken with uh, Dobson's uh, runner who, who was shot through the neck with a nine millimeter burp gun. So he wasn't in too bad a shape, although he had a, a bullet went through his neck. And we went into the hospital there and they took care of us. They, my wounds were very minor, really. And we stayed there overnight. And the next day, they took my friend and I and put us on a train. And this wasn't a boxcar. This was a, a regular train. And it was the type of European train where the doors open out right out to the sidewalk. Uh, you don't, they're not like the American trains where you get in at one end and go down through the aisle. Uh, each compartment has its own entry right out yeah. to the exit to the outside. Yeah. And so they took us the guard and a, and a Red Cross person, an Italian Red Cross person, uh, took us to one of these, opened up the door, and inside the compartment there were two beds, double beds, over and under, that had been set up in this unit. And there were two guys who were on the lower level. Initially, we thought they were Americans, and we found out they were Germans. So there was these two German guys on the two lower bunks, and the guards put us in there, and then they closed the door and locked it. And, and then before we left the, the, the station, uh, these Red Cross uh, people came by and opened up the doors and handed in uh, two parcels of food. Uh, and they made it clear to us that these two parcels were not for the Americans, they were for the Germans. So the, the train started out and uh, my friend and I were standing up in the train and the two Germans, as I said, were in the lower bunks. And as the train's going along, we're saying, you know, well, this is an odd situation, what do we do, what do, what do we do? And uh, eventually one of the Germans said to the other German uh, something about, what do you think we should do about the food? And I got enough of the conversation to know what was going on. And he said, uh, I think we should share it with the Americans. Wow. And so one of them said to, to us, you know, can Sie Deutsch? And, and I said, ja, aber bisschen. And, and he said, uh, Das Essen is for, that, es, that food is for us, but we want to share it with you two. So please open it up and divide it up for the four of us. And that's when we discovered when they went to 
set up in the bed themselves that both of them had a leg amputated. So here's two guys who have just had a leg amputated. We're the guys that did it to them and they want to share their food with us. So it's a side of war that you saw also. It wasn't always hate. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, we stayed in that train until uh, the next day we arrived at a place, I think it was Mantua, I'm not sure about this, Mantua, Italy. It's up in northern Italy. And we were taking, my friend and I were taken off, the two Americans, and we were put in a uh, building where we spent the night, and then the next day we were put on a, on a train, taken to the train station, and put on a train that uh, we were put in boxcars. And there was about 45 or 50 men to a boxcar. And these were boxcars that were Fiat boxcars, made by Fiat. And there was doors on one side. Uh, there was one window in the back of the side that was on the station side and one window, a small window, uh, on the outside of the train car. Uh, the, 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 the windows were both covered with barbed wire, but there was no way of closing them. Uh, there was no closure on them. So the, the cold air came in there, and the, and the rain or snow, whatever, would come in. Anyway, we were in those box cars for several days. They would stop once a day. They would stop at a, at a station because they had to take on wood and water uh, because there was no diesel or oil or gas. Uh, so they were all burning wood. They were steam engines. We arrived, uh, our, our destination was a place called Muhlenberg, Germany, or Stalag 4B, which was a reception center where all prisoners, all new prisoners were brought there and then they were sorted out by nationality, by rank, and by MO, or military occupation. Uh, so, for example, the Air Force were all kept separate. Uh, officers were all kept separate. Uh, so, the rest of us were into uh, bar sorted out and put in barracks where you had just uh, uh, PFCs, if you will, or privates. Uh, Although, no, we had non-coms also. We had some sergeants in there. Uh, you didn't stay there long, though, in Stalag 2B. No, we didn't stay there 4B. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we only stayed there uh, probably uh, a day or two until they assembled the group that was to go on. And they had a pretty good-sized train full to go into deeper into Germany. So we went in another boxcar train and uh, we ended up at Stalag 2B in a place called Hammerstein, Germany, uh, which is the city, and then the, the, the Stalag 2B was actually in a place called Schlachau. So we arrived at, at Stalag 2B in Schlachau. Initially, a group of us were taken to a, we were walked down the road about a mile to uh, another compound that was all nothing but Russians, Russian prisoners. We were put in there and the reason they gave us was that they had discovered some toxic thing, some disease or something that had broken out in, in Stalag 4B. It was minor, but they said, but uh, they were concerned that they didn't want us if we were carrying it. They, didn't, they needed like 24 hours to find out if we were gonna get sick with this, whatever it was. and. So they put us in with the Russians because they didn't care if we infested the Russians. They could care less. But they didn't want to infest the Americans or the British or the other nationalities mm. that were in, in, in Stalag 2B. Uh, it turned out to be a blessing for us because I got to talk to Russian prisoners through the barbed wire fence and they gave me a lot of good advice if you ever escape. Because they knew, everybody who was a prisoner knew that you were, at some point you're going to think about escaping. You're going to make a try. And uh, so they, they told me, you know, uh, when you get near the Russian front, you, you'll know 
first of all, it isn't like the Americans where your airplanes are coordinated with the ground. The uh, Russians, the, the airplanes are attached to the ground forces, so they're right there. They're, they're, not, coming, uh, they're not coming to a, a place 15 kilometers away. They said that you should, if you escape, don't try to go through the front. Uh, get close. If you hear artillery fire uh, or mortar fire, you'll know that you're close. Stop, find a place to hide out, and let the front go over you. Uh, hide out at night, stay away from the main road, because they have burned, the, the, the Russians burn everything to the ground, burn all the homes to the ground. And, and then in the morning, in the daylight, after the Russian f fighting troops come through, then come out and reveal yourself and tell them you're an American. Well, that was good to know because that, that, that really turned out to be the situation with me, myself. Uh, we were in a day, so they, they found out that there was no problem with us, so they took us back, the group of us, and put us back into Stalag 2B with the rest of our guys. Uh, That's okay. So now, when you were at 2B, you were mischievous and ended up having to work at a, um, you ended up having to work at a um, farm, at a woods, at a wood, yeah. wood farm, yeah. Yeah. chopping down trees. No, no, that was, that was the second. The first place they sent us, they sent a group of eight of us, they sent to work on a farm. Mm. And our first job on that farm was harvesting potatoes. After the potatoes were all harvested, we were assigned to threshing wheat. They had this ancient wheat threshing machine. I mean, it was really old. And they taught us how to use it and how to empty the grain into the bags and how to take the straw out in the piles and stack them up. And we're working at this and we decided after a day or two or three, whatever, that it was pretty boring, that it was pretty laborious, and we needed a break. So we sabotaged the threshing, wheat threshing machine by throwing a fork into it, yeah. a pitching fork. It sounded like a tin can factory that went berserk, but the noise was unbelievable, but it certainly got the attention of the, both the farmer as well as the German guards and they were absolutely blazing mad. They lined the eight of us up against the wall of the barn and threatened to shoot us right then and there. And they said, even the rules of Geneva, uh, you're, you, you can punish prisoners for destroying German property. Anyway, the, the farmer said, you're not, he stopped him, he said, no, no, no. You, he said, I'm not gonna have dead Americans. I'm not gonna have my wife and kids seeing people shot on our farm. Uh, if you want to shoot them, take them back to the camp and shoot them. So that's what they did. They took a, they, they had to notify, and everything worked slowly because there's not much telephone service or any kind of service, so you, you have to wait to, to send a message by, by, through the mail, uh, and it has to get on a train and go back to, from where you came from. So they took us back into the Stalag 2B, and we were, put up in front of the camp commander who uh, was indicted after the war for killing Americans. He was the camp commandant. And he, he threatened to shoot us and then he said, but he said, we need, we need workers. We need some hard workers, some heavy workers to cut, cut our timber. Uh, so you're gonna be finding out what hard labor is. So anyway, they sent the same eight of us out to a forest, and seven guys funny. and myself, and uh, went to this place where we, it was, a, there was like a farmer's house, or the, the guy, the, the German civilian, his name was Carl Weiss, which is Carl White, Weiss is white. And he had a, a wife, Oma Denbeck, his name was Denbeck, Oma Denbeck, Oma's grandma Denbeck, and then his wife, and then a granddaughter. Uh, and I talk about her in the book. Anyway, they had taken the house that the, that the uh, Oberka Forester lived in, and they added on uh, a, a thing that had 
uh, three rooms on it. Two rooms were the bedrooms, so they had two bunk beds in each one of them. So there was four guys in each room for the eight of us. Then there was another room that had a rough wooden table and two benches, uh, so we could sit at the table if we had anything to eat. <laughs> uh, More potato soup. Pardon? More potato soup. More potato soup. <laughs> so uh, that's a good point. Uh, our food, our standard food ration in a, in a PW camp, in any of them, was pretty well the same all over, with some exceptions. A bowl of potato soup and a fifth of a roll of, roll of bread a day. Hmm. Uh, if you were in certain areas of Germany, instead of potatoes, you got turnips or something like that. Uh, we had the potato soup, but I would almost defy you to find a potato in any, in any of the soup we had. This white water. Uh, you prayed for the Red Cross to come through, because when you got a Red Cross parcel, it was gone to a banquet at the Ritz, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they were so few and far between, because at this stage of the war, the Germans knew they were losing, and they had no more moral responsibility as far as what, if you starved to death, that was tough luck, that the German. So they were stealing these parcels and eating them, taking them home to their families, the German guards. Mm -hmm. Bill, yeah. I just got notice from our cameraman that our time is up, but I do the amazing part of the story, East to the Ruskies by Bill Zartman, is an amazing book to procure and read because your story from Stalag to B, from the farm cutting wood, 3,000 kilometers after he escaped is an amazing story to be read and I feel terrible to cut you off right now but our listeners will have to get this book now to read how we're so lucky to have heard the story directly from you um, East to the Ruskies you can find it online um, I urge you to get the book and to read the rest of the story I wish I could tell it to you, but I can't because it's so good to read. It was such a good book to read. Um, and I thank you so very much. Now you're going to be bombarded. If anybody from town sees you on the street, they're going to want to know the rest of the story, but you're going to have to read the book. Um, it was fascinating. And Bill, I can't thank you enough for coming to tell us the beginning of the story but it's up to our listeners to get the book to read My the rest pleasure. of the story. My pleasure. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you. You bet. This is Living Histories. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.